What's up, guys? Uh, Vic here, a uh, working actor, among other things. Uh, joined with uh, Mr. Skunk Manhattan, also a working man. He'll do anything for money, so that means he's a musician. Uh, 20 bucks is 20 bucks, right, guys? Uh, <laughs> joining us today on the podcast, Mr. Kevin Keller. Kevin, I'm going to read just a really brief bio uh, okay. for you here real quick just to introduce you, and then we'll get into it. So Mr. Kevin Keller, New York-based composer, whose work bridges neoclassical and ambient music with strong focus on production in evocative soundscapes for over 30 years. Kevin's been leading the uh, been a leading voice in the ambient and neoclassical music scene with 14 albums that merge classical composition with electronic innovation. His latest album, Even Song, is a beautifully produced medieval-inspired ambient journey that reimagines the mystical visions of the 12th century. And so we'll be digging into that as well. Welcome, sir. Thank you for joining us tonight on the podcast on the show podcast yeah, this thing right yeah cool. this whatever this is thank whatever you. this is yeah yeah like, well you it's know, gonna... <laughs> I, I couldn't have described this album better than you just did that was really i'm gonna oh. have to pull i'm gonna have to pull that quote that's good yeah <laughs> <laughs> it'll be in the show notes yeah great <laughs> very cool um so we yeah before we started recording we were talking about uh skunk was talking about visiting uh um you know, some Civil War sites and listening to Billy Eilish, Eilish setting the mood, you know, some making making a soundtrack there. Um, so, uh, I, you know, maybe for for like the guys like me that uh, spent time in the military that don't know big words good. Uh, <laughs> when we talk about like ambient, ambient music, uh, what like what comes to mind? Like what, what's kind of what's your thought around that? Ambient music is music that creates a sense of atmosphere. Um, I think at its best, uh, it's, it, it's music that you would put on and I think ideally like, you know, listen to on headphones or on really good speakers and, uh, let it take you, you know, to some, some new place you haven't been before. Uh, so that's, that's how I would best describe ambient music for, for most people. Yeah. 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 Agreed. Vic, you said 14 albums. Is that accurate is this your 14th album for some reason i was thinking 13 but man you've got a lot of material i was <laughs> i i've just Fun skimmed stuff. the surface i think i've listened to about three i kind of started with the latest and then i mm -hmm. went all the way back and mm. yeah it is it's kind of i feel like when i'm listening to it it certainly is is such a ethereal it it's weird it's like in this type of music which i love actually i love soundscapey yeah. stuff and sound effects yep. and you know and all that kind of atmospheric film whatever it might be used for like but I feel like it's that kind of, it's certainly not like, hey, put it on and casual. I mean, you can, it can be kind of background, but it's like really honing in is what makes it super cool. Like just there's so much within, you know, it, it, within there. And I, all these little things I kind of pick up, but it forces me to really focus on the music, which I really like, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. That's kind of one thing I've gotten out of just from, you know, the small percentage I've, I've been able to listen to so far. Um, I was wondering initial influences like what got you playing music when you were younger was it you know you probably i'm assuming didn't just go like as a five or ten year old like i want to make ethereal soundtrack music <laughs> like you know what i mean like what what initially got you interested in music what was your first instrument where where did this all hmm. this journey begin for you i would say that it started when i was probably six years old and i was a guitar player so i my dad is a guitar player so i grew up with him playing the guitar and uh, but he's, you know, he's like more of a rock, you know, old style rock guitar player. So my initial uh, experience making music was just playing, you know, music on guitar, uh, playing music by like the Ventures, you know, like old school, oh, yeah. like surf guitar kind of stuff, which is what my dad was playing. Okay. And I, I remember one time uh, learning how to play dueling banjos, you know, from the movie. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. So I learned how to play that. So that's, that was, that's how I got started. And it wasn't really until high school that I, uh, moved over to the piano and started playing piano. And that was around the same time that I was, became interested in writing my own music. Um, but it's interesting going back though, uh, to the beginning again, like in terms of what music I was listening to, it's interesting. I mean, I was listening, of course, to whatever my parents were listening to, which was, you know, like the Eagles and the Doobie Brothers and Fleetwood Mac, that kind of thing. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. And I, but there's a there is this song. Uh, it's, you know, Don McLean's song, American Pie, which, of course, is a classic that we uh -huh. all know. 
that song really spoke to me as like as like a nine year old kid. I just the 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 lyrics to that song are so they paint such a vivid picture of what's going on, you know, in each of those verses, you know, like talking about the the football game and the and the you know and the the gesture on the sidelines and that whole thing and Satan laughing with delight because the because the music had died and um, and I and I think. It, the reason I'm bringing that up is that when I got into making music myself, maybe 10 years later, the whole idea of creating like vivid imagery with music, I think it comes from as from as far back as that is, is like American Pie and also like film scant soundtracks like uh, the Close Encounters of the mm. Third Kind soundtrack by John Williams, which I was yeah. completely into when I was 10 or 11. And then a little bit later, the score, all the music that was in 2001, A Space Odyssey, mm. which is not, you know, that wasn't written for that film, but it was, you know, it was very carefully curated, you know, by uh, oh, Kubrick was a master by Kubrick. With, with music. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Um, and so like that music also, like the music of Ligeti and, um, and Strauss, both Strauss's, mm -hmm. you know, Richard Strauss and Johann Strauss mm -hmm. and, and, um, just all of that music had a profound effect on me. And that movie in particular had a profound effect on mm -hmm. me in terms of just my thoughts about where we come from, where are we, you know, how did, how did this all happen? You know, um, where are we going? You know, what's the meaning of life? You know um, I mean, that's that, that movie ans asks and I think tries to answer some of those questions. And those are the same questions that have been, have been kind of the theme of my, my work as a composer, pretty much my whole, the, of the 14 albums that I've done. So, yeah, man, you know, some, yeah. Of, some of the stuff you just said, it really got my brain going. And, you know, <laughs> yeah, uh, of course, Vic doesn't understand any of that 2001 stuff. He's like, no. what? No, no. I, honestly, that movie is so like, it's a great, brilliant film. And, and I'm just, yeah. you do watch the end and go, huh? <laughs> but it's open to interpretation. I'm sure, I'm sure there's all kinds of documentaries and, you know, thesis, synopsis, and whatever on it. And, you know, but I think that's that sometimes art in its most beautiful form is open to interpret. It's not just cut and dry. It can be either way, right? It can be sure. very well laid out. Um, like you said, a vivid picture painted lyrically by, by American Pie, or it can be something very, you know, abstract, like, you know, a lot of what 2001 is. And it hadn't really occurred to me, but who was the third, not the two Strausses, but the third composer you said, and I'm assuming it, his music is the very sort of, for lack of a better word, like atonal modern. Yes. Yeah. What, who right. was that composer? Um, that's a, that, that was a Hungarian composer named Georgi Ligeti. Okay. And, um, and his music, there were, there's a, a, his music is used a lot in that film. Right. Uh, and yeah, it is that more atonal kind of uh, tone cluster kind of yeah. music. Like texture, um, like adds yeah, texture. Very, it's it's yeah. all about it, texture. And in fact, the, the piece, of music that is used of his at the end of the film when Dave Bowman is traveling through that kind right. of time tunnel, that piece of music is actually titled Atmospheres. Like okay. that's the name of it. Which is, um, yeah. Yeah. Amazing for, was that film 1969? I want to say. Uh I think Somewhere so, yeah. like I think that, so. you know, yeah. something yeah. in there. Yeah. But yeah. just really incredible to think of, you know, um, just, visually and sonically what was happening in that film and i i think you know I, we've gotten so desensitized in the last you know 30 40 50 years but i think things that were coming out early in early film i do stuff with old silent film and i it's only recently that i've kind of gotten in this and became really gained this massive appreciation for these early films and the german impressionist films and i mean they're just brilliant you know and see the value and uh just how important they they are and, and um but also, you know, musically with stuff like this and with directors like Kubrick, who goes on and on. But I, I did one thing when you mentioned that I, the, the juxtaposition of those sounds and those composers is so cool to think about the, the trajectory <laughs> of that film from the dawn right. of man to the space age and the technological age. And I kind of it never really kind of hit me that way before. But I just thought of that when you were talking about it. And I, that in and of itself, I think, is kind of a cool I don't know if that was an intentional metaphor by. Kubrick or not, of course, he comes into Johann Strauss when they're in space. So I don't know, right. but, but um, yeah, it's just it's interesting, and um, uh, I love that you that you mentioned that. What was the other one? There was what was the other film? Something else you mentioned or um... Close Encounters? I think of the third. Yes, film, Close Encounters. Yeah. yeah, I was going to ask you. I, I can't remember if it was an, a documentary or something I'd seen once about that 
simple five note composition, right? And that's mm -hmm. the master of, or the mastery of so many, probably any great composer maybe is melody. And then you can leverage that melody to the end of time, right? But sure. such a, I mean, John Williams, always a simple, hummable, singable melody. You don't have to be a musician to hear it and recreate it and love it, internalize it. But then what he does with it is phenomenal, right? But yeah, that five note melody, something about the way that it ended on the fifth, I thought was interesting, like leaving, mm. um, it was sort of intentional to leave it like unresolved, right? Yeah, right. Um, and I wonder, I don't know if that's true. There was something I saw about it. And, but I also read something about how they played around with a pretty extensive set of like melodies before landing oh, sure. on that one. But sure. uh, yeah. yeah, really cool stuff. And it, it's funny the age gap that I see everybody knows star Wars. Right? right. And I don't know if you, I'm sure you went through this at some point too, with the ear training and like, Oh, perfect fist, star Wars, a major seven, <laughs> our generation goes a major seven, <laughs> Superman, 1979. Oh, that, that second in the uh, close encounters kids now are like, huh? Who? What? Right. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like the star Wars reference still works somewhere over the rainbow. And, and those other ones are jaws might still work, but you're like, right. yeah, so, okay. We can't do the major seventh with Superman anymore. <laughs> no. Right. <laughs> right. But I, I, I wanted to uh, pivot or kind of take off of, from what you were saying about the variety of music and the variety of, of styles that happened in 2001. Like to me, that like that really is another thing that I that I've tried to carry with me in terms of my making my albums so that I don't I feel like you if you have something that's light, you also have to have something that's dark. You have to you, like an album should should take you from one to the other. And I think that that's, you know, I mean, if you grow up as a kid and you're watching that movie and you're hearing the Blue Danube waltz and then you're hearing Ligeti's atmospheres, you know, uh, but it but it somehow works because there's a through line to the film and there's a through line to that music somehow. Mm -hmm. um, so I just kind of grew up thinking, well, that's that's what a good collection of music does. It It, it starts in one place and it goes somewhere else and and maybe to a third place and yeah and um, i mean you're an yeah. album thinker man you know I what am. i mean like I am. i'm an yeah. album guy and i have such everyone ah, just release singles 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 it's a singles world i get it but i i have such a hard time because i just i conceptualize things as a batch of songs and there is that right. you know i like the the pink floyd peaks and valleys and the big you know the the big intro and the epic ending and you know yeah. it's like it's so important and especially from a cinematic standpoint, you know, some of those maybe 2001, maybe being a pinnacle example of that, just how important that is. And anyone will tell you that any director, you know, Spielberg or those guys is without them. You take the music away that it's a whole different, you know, <laughs> right. a whole different ballpark. You know, I mean, what are you watching at that point? So it's that powerful and that important. Were you um, inspired then to sort of like want to write? Uh, I mean, I know a career kind of goes in many different avenues as a musician and it's not necessarily planned, but were your early aspirations anywhere? Like I, you know, like a lot of kids, you know, teen, I want to be a rock star and I want to do this. Or were you like, <laughs> I want to be a film composer. I want to po compose for television. I want to do sync. Or, did you have, where did all this yeah. kind of start? Uh, well, at the point that I got really into writing my own music, which was when I was in college, um, I my biggest influence and inspiration at the time was the, the German electronic band Tangerine Dream. Um, so they, they were, and they were huge when I, this, I was in college in the late eighties. So Tangerine Dream was really kind of at their peak at that point, because they were doing huge tours in the, in the U S they also had done the music for risky business and they had done, oh. you know, they had done music yeah. for uh, that Tom Cruise film called legend. Uh, which was that kind of like oh, fairies right, okay. and, yeah. you know, unicorn kind of thing. So they were really all over the place. Uh, also, I was really into Vangelis, who had done the score for Chariots of Fire in 82. And, um, you know, sort of similar music. I mean, in, in that also Vangelis also did the music for Blade Runner, you know, mm. so so that kind yeah. of like uh, synthesizer, maybe sci-fi kind of thing was was very hip at the time. Um, and so I really aspired at that point as a, you know, 18 or 19 year old kid, I wanted to be like the guys in Tangerine Dream. Like I wanted to be playing my music live. I wanted to be putting out records and going on tour and that kind of thing. Um, and, and doing film, film music was not, it, it wasn't really on my radar as something that I thought I would do. Now, much, much later, I, I have done 
Um, I mean, I, I, I ended up studying film scoring at Berkeley College of Music, but that was many, many years later. Um, but uh, yeah, early on uh, at that point, um, yeah, I, I mean, to me, those guys were rock stars. It just wasn't, you know, it was electronic rock maybe. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, that's, that was very much what I imagined was like being on a stage with light show and lasers and you know, all of that kind of thing. I mean, it's again, that kind of comes back to just how, how um, revolutionary for lack of a better word, um, uh, you know, what was going on with 2001 is, and just thinking back to going back even further, thinking of those, the early sense, like the seventies stuff, whether it be Wendy Carlos, obviously, right. Yeah. Or craft yeah. work, you know, yeah. and I think those guys probably influenced everyone from who you're talking about to nine inch nails to everybody. Right. Yeah. And, yep. and uh, are you kind of, uh, are you, do you have are you into old sense do you, are you a collector of any sort like that and no i i am into them i'm not really a collector of them i have uh a juno 106 that i bought brand new in 1985 so i'm wow. the original i'm the original owner of it and it's just off camera to my cool. left <laughs> um and i use that i use that on even song quite a lot um and uh, i ha i also have a moog uh, synthesizer, mm -hmm. but it's a new one. It's the Moog Grandmother, which they just came out with maybe five or six years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's that, you know, it's the classic Moog kind of sound, which also is all over the album, even song. Yeah. Um, but that's it. Those are the only two analog keyboards that I have. And, um, you know, I live in New York. I don't have a huge studio <laughs> space, right. you know? Yeah. I mean, if I had, um, you know, a room twice the size, maybe I'd have three more keyboards, <laughs> you know, but not uh, to mention, yeah. I feel, I don't know a ton about this stuff. I've, I've known of, or know a few guys that I've been really into sort of vintage synth and I've seen a lot of really awesome in, in vintage gear. And, um, and I know like maybe at some point in time they dropped and people scooped them up and that were into that kind of stuff. And that now I think a lot of that stuff is really expensive. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yes. You know? Sure. Yeah, I mean, if you're looking for, say, an actual like vintage Moog, it'll cost you ten grand mm -hmm. uh, easily, wow. maybe more. Uh, and if you're looking for like a vintage like ARP twenty six hundred, which are really hard to find, uh, those again, those are like ten thousand dollars. But I mean, you know, you can buy the virtual version of it. So. Right. That's an interesting <laughs> you know? thing, and I, I yeah. you know, I have a couple of questions. Like, are you how how much uh, self engineering do you do? Do you kind of do the whole process and i have a lot of questions actually about your process <laughs> okay but... yeah let's get into it um yeah like yeah first of I, all I mean, composition like what is your mm. compositional approach my compositional approach is generally um me sitting at a piano keyboard and you know like you're talking about john williams with his five note melodies you know um i i i spend a lot of time kind of finding finding chords or melodies uh, to work with. Although the exception being with even songs, since those half of the album at least is based on existing melodies that were written 800 years ago. I, you know, I had sort of a head start on this particular album, but in general um, I'm, I'm working pretty traditionally, like, like sitting at the piano with a piece of, you know, music paper and a pencil. And I'm actually, you know, kind of, no writing things down and kind of playing around with things. The other thing that I will do as well is spend a lot of time on sound design. So, so I'll just, you know, I'll pull up, you know, pull out my Moog synthesizer, make some really weird noise on it, you know, um, process it. And, you know, if it's working, then I'll record that. And um, so it's very much kind of like collecting ideas in, mm -hmm. initially to, that become, that form into complete, you know, ideas at some point. So, and then, yeah, in terms of the engineering, um, that depends, uh, de you know, project to project. Um, I mean, I've done plenty of albums where it was completely done in house in this studio where I did all of the recording, mixing, editing. I mean, I don't do the mastering. I at least send it out to do that part, but, mm -hmm. but this album, even song, um, I did all the pre-production here in the studio. So I was recording all of the synthesizer parts and the other, like the, the church organ sounds and things like that. And then we went into a recording studio here in New York called Reservoir Studios. And that was where we recorded 
the singers and the string mm. players. So we had two full days in the studio to record all of that. And they were, you know, they were basically overdubbing, you know, they were recording over the pre-recorded tracks that I had brought with me. And then I did all the mixing here. Uh, and then, and then I sent it to my mastering engineer in Nashville that I've worked with a bunch. So, I'm um, uh, just curious yeah. who that is. Uh, his name is Chris Fresco and he's in Nashville. He's, he started out here in, well, he started out at Berkeley, <laughs> okay. Berkeley college of music, but he, he lived here in New York until about, I want to say maybe 10 years ago. And then he moved to Nashville. Um, and he's been there ever since. Gotcha. So, yeah. He's very, very good. So you do a lot of actual audio recording. Do you do a lot of, do you have MIDI stuff that you use as well? I would, I would think, I would assume, or, or not as much. Um, well, I mean, obviously, so like the, the analog synthesizers, that's being recorded as audio, you know, direct right, live audio right. from the boards, but there's a lot of, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of MIDI audio happening, uh, that's just happening in the box, in, you know, in my, in my computer. And so do you use uh, yeah. like some of that stuff as like maybe strings and stuff and maybe sometimes that's the final cut but then like this last case you were like where where are you relaying stuff like that or is it all just here's the sheet music for the string players or is it a combination mm. well yeah i mean when i'm working on a track if it's got strings in it i will i'll do a mock-up of you know using sampled strings mm -hmm. um and then and then i'll replace it with with live musicians. Um, so, so there is that part of the process where I am then outputting it as sheet music that, that can then be given to the musicians. So, um, you know, cause I, I mean, obviously I prefer live strings to sampled ones. Right. Whenever you, you know. can, right. It may, right. the analog and the uh, uh, real musicians, obviously I, we're, right. we're from that era, I suppose. And it just, I mean, I know like some people can get real, picky and snobby on this stuff and budget is a factor, but yeah. Right. I mean, if you can use human beings that are, that can do right. it justice. Sure. Right. Um, what, what about like, so, uh, software for, um, like compositional software? Do you use like Sibelius or anything like that? Mm. Or do you write? No. Um, well, so to do the, sheet music output i'm using finale although oh, you still use i heard right, that well, got, that it changed it hands well, to steinberg then, well, or something no yeah well no finale's just they're, they're they're no longer updating it um it's it just doesn't i mean you can still use it. It, it as long as you have it on your computer you can still use it okay uh, but they have stopped updating it they've stopped supporting it and they're basically going out of business the company that does that um so people are all shifts you know in a panic and they're all looking for, you know, some people are moving over to Sibelius some some are moving over to, I can't even remember the name of it. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, uh, but yeah, finale is what I've been using for, you know, forever uh, for the sheet music. And then for the, but for the actual, like um, recording all, all the MIDI tracks and doing all the actual composition, I'm using a program called digital performer, okay. uh, which has been around since um, the mid eighties. So like I, um, I mean, the reason I use Digital Performer is just that it's a program I have used now for 40 years. So it's just, oh wow, <laughs> you know, um, it, it was a brand new program for the Mac in 1984, which was oh. right when I got into college. And um, and it was incredibly primitive at that That's time. That's wild, you know? man, to think and about now, that. I mean, now it's like, you know, um, you know, it's it's one of the ones that like, you know, big film composers use. I think Danny Elfman uses digital performer, mm -hmm. um, a couple of other pretty well-known people in Hollywood use it. Um, and then, you know, also though, for, for the final mixing, I'm usually in pro tools. So, okay. so it's kind of, I'm kind of all over the place in terms of software, um, and in terms of, you know, technology, but, um, yeah. So the, so the album, this album, even song, all the pre-production was done in digital performer. Then we brought all of those tracks over into pro tools, recorded the vocals and strings in pro tools. And then I did all the final mixing in pro tools. Okay, so, cool. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. Very cool. Um, something popped in my head, but why I can't remember it, Vic, you can, <laughs> you can take a turn. <laughs> Help us out. No, Vic. I, yeah. So you mentioned church organs and getting ready for this podcast. I was just listening to different movie soundtracks. I'm like, what had cool ambient soundtracks and, and uh, Hans Zimmer comes mm. to mind, right? Cause he did a, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of Nolan films. Uh, I, I think the, probably the one of the couple of famous ones he did was the Joker's theme and uh, the dark Knight. It's mm -hmm. just, I think that that violin, that single violin, 
uh, intro is just like really creepy sounding. And then uh, Interstellar was another right. one that he did. And it had like all the church, church organs in it. Right. Uh, and that yeah. one scene where they're like trying to, you know, the space, or I guess the ship that, that uh, they were on is like falling into orbit of a planet. And so they're going after it. And so that just, that that's what it reminded me of. I had, it just popped in my head real quick. And I was like, oh yeah, yeah. And then, uh, you know, when you were referencing like some of those, uh, movies in late seventies, early eighties, I was thinking about John Carpenter's the thing because he, oh, yeah. uh, oh yeah. Inicio, uh, Morricone. Oh, oh, yeah. Morricone. Right. Yeah. So and yeah. he had a, a, little, a little bit different. Yeah. He had the, uh, he had the, it was a little more, uh, electronic, but just, just the tone that the, the, the atmosphere that it set, it was just really creepy and it just fit that movie perfectly. Yeah. Yeah. I have seen that movie many times. I absolutely love that movie. Arguably, even my favorite Carpenter movie. I like several, oh, it's but totally my favorite yeah. for sure. Masterpiece, yeah. man! Just yeah. what a great. Yeah. It never, I love it. And um, even the uh, recently saw, I guess it was the sequel or something. I thought that was actually pretty good too. But anyway, back to that. I never knew. I also it was just John Carpenter. It was very John Carpenter style. Like boom, boom. But those synth. Maybe that was him. <laughs> yeah. Just that thing. And then I saw Marconi in the credits and I was like, what? No way. Like it just blew right. my mind that he was that in that sort of minimalist sort of, uh, uh, you know, you think of him, this is the spaghetti Westerns, obviously he's done all kinds of different yeah. stuff, but right. I, right. it was cool to see his name in that. And it was really cool to, um, I literally actually watched, uh, did you ever see the movie, the hateful eight, the Tarantino, um, hmm. movie, you know, I have not oh, seen he did that, that one too. Yeah. Right. Really long. And I kind of was like, eh, it looks kind of boring. I don't know. I ended up watching that movie and <laughs> kind of became a fan of the movie because of Morcone. Uh, well, I think he won a Grammy for it or something right before he passed away. Or, he or won the Oscar been, for that. Yes. Or the yeah, Oscar. Yeah. The yeah, Oscar. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. and it was just like, oh, it's so good, man. And yeah, I mean, I, that's happened to me a few times. Like uh, I have watched a film because of the music. I ended up watching the whole Twin Peaks <laughs> <laughs> series one time because of this band phantom Moss. i was like i was like where is this this firewalk song and it never even happened because it was in the sequel movie but i ended up watching this whole tv show because of it. i forget who the composer for that was but it had its own oh obviously yeah that was someone that um what's his name uses um i can't think of a the director for that everybody knows uh lynch david lynch oh david lynch oh, yeah, yeah. yeah yeah but um yeah, man. Oh, I well, Vic kind of said what I was thinking. Actually, was uh, when you mentioned, uh, I guess you mentioned Zimmer and then Elfman too. It's kind of cool mm. seeing. I mean, Zimmer's been doing this with these incredible musicians like Guthrie Govan and these kind of guys, and um, and then Danny Elfman touring again. Like, yeah. I mean, like touring, touring. And I think he's like, that's so cool, man. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, have you seen any of those guys live? Have you seen these kind of concerts? I mean, no. I know everything under the sun come, probably comes through New York, you know, but. Does it, though? I mean, I don't. I mean, I know Danny Elfman. I think he was here. I, has Hans Zimmer ever done a show here? If he has, I totally missed it. But uh, yeah. yeah, no, I have never I've never been to any of those things. So, Are you into Zorn at all? I know Zorn is in New York making an album like every 15 minutes. John Zorn. <laughs> <laughs> John Zorn that makes a lot of music. That is true. Um, what a, yeah, very yeah. prolific. Yeah, I mean, I've I've met him. I, oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. He stole he stole a friend of mine's seat actually at a show, <laughs> like yeah. many many years ago. I was at a at a performance where John Zorn's music was, and uh, this friend of mine and I we had to sit in separate rows, and um, because of how the the seating was, and I turned around, and he wasn't my friend wasn't where the, where he was sitting and he was sit like three rows back. And I said, what happened? And he said, some jerk took my seat. <laughs> and that jerk was John Zorn. <laughs> did you know, did you know it was John Zorn at the time? Did you see uh, or? Uh, it, yes. When I turned and saw who he was talking about, I was like, okay, you know, I mean, so I you didn't... were rolling up your sleeves and you were like, Oh, it's John Zorn. Yeah. He's already made eight albums and it's only <laughs> February. Like, ah, right. we'll let it slide. <laughs> yeah, we had a, this is one of those obnoxious questions where you just assume like, oh, you live in Austin, Vic? Like, do you know blah? Like, oh. uh, but we had a guest, <laughs> we we had a guest, uh, Mark Roselli on the show from East Side Sound and uh, he works a lot. He's done so many records with John Zorn yeah. there. I think it's, I know, you know, I have actually, you heard of that place? I, I know Mark. Yeah, you know, know Mark. Mark. Okay, Roselli. cool. Yeah. So, yeah. well, there, there you go. I yeah. thought it might be a possibility. He was recently at a party that I threw like a month oh, really? or so ago. Yeah, yeah. He played uh he like sat in and played bass with uh some friends of mine um that were playing at this yeah, it was like a little private 
uh, gathering that I was co-hosting. So cool. Yeah, yeah we threw yeah. one of his tunes. I forget that album that he had, Vic. Uh, what the name of it was, but it was super cool, man. Yeah, because mm-hmm. I know he's always working, but he actually had put it on an album with a, a, a comrade of his, and it was very, very cool stuff. But I can't remember what it was. It started with a T. To this, I, I'm not gonna butcher it like that. But <laughs> that's, that, was anyway. a, that was a few podcasts ago. I don't remember. What What part of New York are you in, Kevin? I'm on the Upper West Side. Are you and you're from there originally? Or are you from like the city no, proper? No, I'm from California originally. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, the hair I, gave it away. I knew. Oh yeah. We should have started. We should have mentioned something and just had you be like, "Oh yeah, on the 101," and we'd be like, "Yep, yeah, he's 405." <laughs> yeah. So I grew up. Well, I was born in San Diego, but I grew up oh. mostly mostly in Sacramento, which is where my parents still live. Um, and then I was in the Bay Area for a very long time in the San Francisco, Berkeley. Damn, area. you've lived in all the cool places, man. I have, yeah. And wow. then I moved, and then I moved from there to New York in 2002. So I've been here for a long time. Uh, was that move work related or just change yeah. your pace? Yeah, pretty much. Um, I at the time wanted to get more into writing music for contemporary dance, uh, like ballet, contemporary ballet and dance. And there really wasn't much going on in the San Francisco area for that. And it was time. I just wanted a change of uh, environment. And I had come to New York a couple years before and really loved it. And I just thought, well, if I want to do music for dance, New York City is like literally the capital of the dance world. So uh, so I moved here in 2002 and just started going to a lot of shows and meeting a lot of choreographers and, and ended up doing many, many things for dance. I think I've probably written music for probably 40 different dance wow, performances awesome. yeah awesome um including one coming up uh so even song the album even song is actually being uh, there's a ballet that's being a contemporary ballet that's being created around that music that'll premiere in november uh, oh, cool. in uh, in pittsburgh awesome. and in new york so and that's a choreographer that i've worked with a bunch her name is maria caruso and she's based in pittsburgh um so, what, yeah. Uh, when did you say that yeah. premieres? Uh, do, you, uh, do you know when? It, Do you have any exact details on I that? I do. I have exact. Hold on just a sec. While you're looking, yeah. I'll make a joke about rent. Please I was do. just like, you were like, oh, where can I go? Where else in the country can I go and still pay this much rent? <laughs> that <laughs> is true. San Francisco. That's true because my rent, yeah, that is very true. Um, I mean, I got a smaller apartment in New York, but it was, yeah, I paid the same rent in New York as I was paying in Oakland, you know, yeah. before I Oh, in here. Oakland, man. I, yeah. yeah, San Francisco so, is insane. It's yeah. crazy. It is. Uh, so the details are, so Even Song Ballet, the ballet Even Song premieres in Pittsburgh on Friday, November 15th. Uh, 15th, 16th, and 17th is for being performed three times there um, at the Kelly Strayhorn Theater in Pittsburgh. And then the following weekend on the 23rd and 24th of November, it'll be performed in New York City at the Actors Temple, which is an off-Broadway theater on 47th Street. So Awesome. Very yeah, cool, very man. Cool. Yeah. I, I want to say I read something about, I feel like this was on your Wikipedia, maybe... Did you compose a ballet when you were pretty young, or am I wrong about it? I Keller did. composed ballet scores and chamber music, including the da 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 da. Nineteen eighty six. So you were. Oh yeah. You were pretty yes, young composing that stuff. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. Well, that was when I was a composition major in college. And, okay. Okay. Um, so I yeah I wrote a ballet in eighty six. That is true. Um, and I also had the opportunity that same year to write a piece of music for the Kronos Quartet, which uh, which was amazing um i mean they were they were already huge in the in that time period but of course they've gotten even more well known (laughs) over the last 40 years but uh yeah um but yeah that was really quite quite an experience so uh yeah but yeah the the ballet interest goes all the way back to college for sure yeah what composers were influences in that uh realm uh, I think Stra- most of us, Stra- yeah. Stravinsky, Stravinsky okay. was the biggest one. Uh, the Stravinsky ballet is like Rite of Spring in, okay. in particular. Uh, Petrushka, uh, Firebird. I mean, all of the, all of Stravinsky's ballet music is absolutely incredible. Um, so that that I would say is the biggest. And you know, also, I mean, I, I know it's kind of cliche, but Tchaikovsky's you know uh, ballet music as well. Well, that's so, what most people you know. think of, yeah. right? You think right. ballet, you think Tchaikovsky, the, you right? think right, person. you think Nutcracker, you think Swan Lake, right. etc. So yeah, which is but all for, I mean, amazing for a reason. Music. Yeah, right. yes, it's incredible <laughs> right. music. Right. I love those those Russian composers, man. Oh, they're just, and Prokofiev, like yep. those are just some of my absolute favorites. Yep. Yeah. 
Um, and Scriabin. Do you know about Alexander I, Scriabin? I don't. Oh, you should look into him. Okay, okay. I'm, I'm only just... Vic's I mean, a big I've, fan, I think. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Vic, yeah. I, I can tell. I th- is that a Scriabin hat you're wearing? I yeah, think? I think yeah. It is. That's yeah. it, yep. <laughs> yeah. Um, anyway, yes, uh, but really, yeah, those the Russian composers, for sure. Some amazing stuff, yeah. Some other things I see on your, just uh, in terms of in- inspirations for you, Debussy, uh, mm. Brian Eno, in, you know, that makes sense kind of for what we were talking about, right? Um, mm-hmm. Harold Budd, I don't know Harold Budd. Who is that? Oh, wow. That's that's pretty cool. Uh, Harold Budd, he's kind of considered sort of one of the, gran- sort of the grandfather of ambient piano music. Uh, okay. So he was a, he was a piano player. Um, he recorded... So, you know, Brian Eno back in the early 80s released four albums that were called Ambient 1, 2, 3, and 4. Mm-hmm. Um, Ambient 2 was called The Plateau of Mirror, and it is all Harold Budd playing piano, but it's like, you know, heavily processed piano. Um, and I think that's really, I feel like that might be the very first album ever of ambient piano music that was ever recorded by anyone uh, really? that was like 1982 i want to say uh and then they did a follow-up album in 1985 called the pearl which is absolutely stunning it's like one of the best albums you'll ever hear so you you need to go out and find the pearl by harold budd and brian Eno. um and daniel lanois was the was the co-producer on that um and you know he Eno and lanois then went on to then be the co-producers for um the Joshua Tree and um, Unforgettable Fire for U2. So some some pretty good good production <laughs> going on there. Uh, but yeah, Harold Budd is a huge, he's he's within the world of ambient music, especially piano music, I would say he's like the, the number one guy that everybody, including me, <laughs> everybody at some point tries to sound like. Um, right. Because his style is really unique. He played, he plays what he called he calls it soft pedal piano. So it's like he's always got the soft pedal on and he's playing very quietly, but his melodies are absolutely ma- magical. Um, and it's just some of the most beautiful music you'll ever hear. Very, mu- you know, very much like, um, you know, very similar to sort of Eric Satie, Uh-oh. you know, the, the composer from um, the French composer from the early 20th century. So. Ooh, there we go. Oh, All right. there we go. Good. I'm back. I, I don't know what just <laughs> happened there. That was crazy. Okay. All right. Um, um, so where did we get cut off? <laughs> well, you were... Harold Budd, you, soft pedal um, oh, okay. melodies. 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 Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. So Harold Budd, um, yeah. So he's he's just fairly well known in the ambient world, uh, mostly because of Brian Eno. I mean, so Brian Eno is kind of the one that kind of introduced Harold Budd to the world. But yeah, so he's, he what Harold Budd calls it is soft, pia- soft pedal piano. So it's very quiet and very contemplative, but really beautiful melodies. Um, and then you add the sort of atmospheric uh, processing to the piano, and it's it's incredible. So so go out and find the Pearl by Brian Eno and Harold Budd. Okay, yeah, it's a really classic record. So that yeah. that's a really cool thing, and I'm glad this has come up because um, listening to your music, you know, some of it that I've heard. I mean, that's one thing: the textures, the sounds, the delays, the the floatiness of the piano, you know, these, these things that it's not just, you're not just playing a piece on a piano. Like you said, the, the piano affects the way the piano is played. Right. And like, you, and you're saying, this is kind of the origins of some of that, I suppose. Yes. And yeah. um, that's, that's, that's really cool. And I mean, it's pretty modern, you know, a modern approach. And um, I just, I don't even know what else I'm going to say about that, but I just, <laughs> <laughs> I think it's, it's cool because I mean, it, to me, it's like, if I, there are many times with stuff like that um and that's what's so fun about having keyboards and stuff too right i mean that you can take the same melody and change sounds and do add this and add that and it becomes a whole nother thing and there's times from like oh man that all of a sudden that little bit of delay just made this happen you know and that or yep. that huge atmospheric reverb or right i like too. sometimes it's like uh there was this little line and, and something i did the point of the song was to be kind of ethereal and cinematic and it was like, well, I've got this really half step tuned down a half step or that the song was tuned down a half step and that piano was tuned down a half step and kind of out of tune and just gross, like somewhere in between a horror, you know, movie piano and a, <laughs> and a, and a saloon, a Western saloon, Scott Joplin piano. And it was just perfect for it just made 
everything creepier, you know? So I think right. just like those kind of artistic choices are huge when you're dealing with, with this style of comp composition. Mm -hmm. That's very true. Yeah. Um, I mean, like when I was creating initially, so, so some of the basic ideas for the, for the newest record, even song. Yeah. I mean, like a lot of it was experimenting and playing around with the, you know, ambient spaces and, you know, placing instruments in different area, you know, different kind of different types of spaces and um, just being very, very sort of experimental with it. And then, you know, and then some of that actually made its way into the final recording, which, you know, which is always really fun. Cause I, I listen back to it and I'm like, Oh yeah, there, yeah. Like, I, I know there's more to that than what you're hearing, you know, but you know, it might've been a six minute thing and I've, and I've used 20 seconds of it, you know, as a, yeah. as a transitional moment, you know? Uh, yeah. Well, what you just said, I'm wondering if you kind of mean this too, and this is a really cool thing. Uh, and I find myself doing this a lot at, I think sometimes you need the producer to pull to know when to pull you away or, or say, no, this is cool. Now that's kind of crap, you know, like, because mm -hmm. sometimes I'll get really attached to demo stuff, but sometimes it's kind of cool to be like, you know what, that, that squeaky bench, you know, that, that bar stool creaking while I'm playing that acoustic guitar is cool, you know, or right. like, I think it, you know, a lot of, I, I find myself keeping a lot of things that were done in the moment because it's just like, no, that was a vibe that happened. Are you, do you work in that way sometimes where it's like the vibe, if you capture that vibe, you're like, this sure. is going to, you're going to yeah. roll with it. Right. Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh, I mean, yeah, there's this really odd sound that's in the uh, first track on the album that I, that I created with an, with an electric guitar. So I have a, a Fender Telecaster and I was, I had it plugged in and I was trying to make the weirdest noises I could like, you know, like sort of scraping on the pickup and mm -hmm. scraping this, just doing really weird sounds. And then also running it through like a, a couple of analog delays and other things. And it just was the weirdest sound. And, um, and that, yeah, and that ends up being used like on, you know, it, it's it's funny, right? It's like it's a piece of music that's got medieval plain chant and organ and strings. And yet there's this really weird noise that is a sort of transitional noise. When you listen to it, you're like, what is that? What is what is that even what is making that sound? <laughs> and uh, yeah, and then that just came out of this weird day that I was just like, I don't know, I'll just I'm going to record five minutes of the weirdest noises I can make on a guitar. And some of it was really cool. So yeah, I mean, I, I, I feel like my approach is to record everything. And yeah. um, because you never know, like some of the best things that you make will happen almost by accident or happen spontaneously. And it won't be something that you planned to do. And, uh, and it might not even be something that you plan for that album or for that piece of music that you're working on. But, you know, you got to keep it all. So yeah, yeah, good point. And that's, that's a really good advice, I think. And I think a lot of producers I've talked to are, are kind of like that too. And they kind of trick the artist even like, oh, you know, no, no, I just got to warm up. I got to, oh, well, we'll just record it, you know, and while right. I get, you know, and you never, some, you never know when that, that first take, there's something magical sometimes yep. that happens, you know? Oh yeah. Yeah. I think that is, that's, I've seen that a lot. Um, How, yeah, it's uh, interesting. Oh, go ahead. Oh, oh, sorry. No, I was just going to, on even song. I know you mentioned that uh, some of the compositions you're working with are 800 years old. Mm -hmm. uh, how was that was that the inspiration like just to build just kind of this album and enhance with uh, modern day electronics just to bring out like some of those older compositions like what what kind of led you to working with uh with something like that yeah that's an interesting process it was um so i mean i've been aware of the music of hildegard of bingen she was a, a nun that lived in the 1100s uh, she she was very prolific and her music is very well known uh, in the sort of early music and classical music world. Um, but I had never thought of utilizing any of it for my own purposes. And then, I don't know, it was like about th three years ago. So it was like mid, yeah, it was mid October of 2021. And I was sitting here in my studio and I just had this idea like, huh, what would it sound like if I used a couple songs by Hildegard of Bingen, but then like, you know, because her music is all just melody. So I'm free to put whatever I want underneath it because there were no chords or anything. And, I, and even just the title Even Song came to me all in that one moment. And it was almost like the album like appeared to me, <laughs> almost like a fully formed idea. And and so then I, I actually, I just sort of randomly picked one of my favorite songs of hers and played around with it. And the initial version actually sounded a lot like 
like a Hans Zimmer film score. It definitely had that kind of epic kind of quality to it. Uh, but I just really loved the idea of, uh, of using her music and using this, you know, using women singing in unison, which is just such a really beautiful sound. Um, and then it took me like a year of experimenting with different approaches before I really kind of came to find kind of the way into the album. And then it came together pretty fast after that. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, it was it, it 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 this album in particular did start from this very clear idea of I'm going to use music by Hildegard of Bingen. I don't know which pieces, but I knew that that was what I wanted to do. And then I sort of came up with this whole kind of journey, which is like the journey from from early morning to midnight. Like it's like the whole day, yeah. um, you know, the 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 canonical hours of the early church. So there's there's you know eight eight of them and. Um, and then I thought of it as a metaphor for life, you know, I just, so I just thought, okay, well, we start with conception and birth and we go to all the way to death and even what's after death at the end of the album. But, you know, in the end, I only used four songs of hers and the other four tracks on the album are completely original. So, um, but yeah, I mean, it was, it was very much guided. The whole album was very much guided by the music of Hildegard of Bingen and, and her kind of her harmonic approach. So very yeah. cool. Uh, yeah. Nerd stuff here. Uh, <laughs> so <laughs> not you, what I'm about to say, like uh, the, um, so you said that the, the first track though is a melody of hers. That's, yes. Yes. I feel like I'm, maybe I'm totally wrong here. Um, I feel like I got this like Lydian vibe or something out mm, of that, man. Close. Like, you know what I mean? Close. What's, what's, is it just uh, a <laughs> very uplifting major sound or? No, the first out, first track is in Phrygian mode, actually. Is it really? Is, well, yeah, like, I'm not, yeah. I don't feel like I'm close at all, actually. <laughs> no, well, you're off by, I mean, you're I'm, off by I'm, a half step, but uh, <laughs> yeah, um, it's Phrygian mode based on E. So it's that like makes it, more yeah. sense for the time. I was like, yeah. I, Lydian seems weird for the, uh, uh, the medieval right. times. Right. Well, Lydian is the, the second track is in Lydian mode. So, Maybe that's um, what I was yeah. thinking then. Okay, maybe I'm getting which those is two very confused. yeah, and which is very uplifting. Uh, okay, kind of almost okay. magical sounding. Okay, um, then I'm getting them backwards. Okay, okay. Skunk's a big um, fan of Dorian. Oh, well, you know who isn't, right? Yeah, right. I don't. <laughs> I don't feel like I don't feel like Dorian was the the choice mode of the medieval times, right? Like everyone's just having a good old time. <laughs> But uh, yeah, d track seven is in Dorian, so you know. Well, I, there, yeah. well, man, yeah. okay. Yeah. I like. I got to see. I'm glad we talked about this actually, because I, I, I was getting some modal vibes. Oh yeah. And um, you know, but I was like, I, I don't know. It's weird. Like I think you think back, and it, funny enough, at the very beginning of this year, I was reading some. I got some little. You know, I always shop at like Barnes and Noble for like last minute Christmas gifts and stuff. And I, they have those little fold out things like all the French, you know, whatever languages. And there was this music <laughs> thing with history about certain composers and basic theory. And I was like, man, this is great. You know, like this is just a cool little thing. And so I got it and I was like reading it and, um, and it made me go back and I actually listened to some like way 1500s type stuff. I had never listened to, right. Most mm -hmm. uh, probably maybe unless you're a musician, I feel like a lot of people have probably like haven't gone before maybe Bach or something. Right. right. So, but it was, it was kind of interesting. And I, I think like a couple of things on this that I, I found fascinating was, or like, seeing sometimes like jazz just super crazy you know monster pianist and stuff getting really moved by the most simplistic sort of monk chanting mu this very <laughs> for lack of a better word primitive music right mm -hmm. but i think there's yeah. there's something to that right the, the origins of everything where that all stems to the deeper your connection is with that the more you can understand everything else and i and it, you know kind of like you kind of think of this older music as more simplistic in that in that way mm -hmm. and not so much like modal. Right. But, right. but I mean, I don't know. I'm as a educated, you know, someone who's educated on this, I'd love to kind of hear just your thoughts. And I don't know any history, any light you could shed on the sort of the well, modes and their I mean, place throughout you're... the, throughout musical history, but for Western music, at least. Yeah. I mean, you're definitely right in terms of like, I mean, I, yeah, I think of this music as I call it primordial, right. It's like, right. you know, it's like the very earliest, Kind of the earliest form of Western music is is this chants, the chants that were written, you know, in the 1100s around that time. And yeah, I mean, it definitely like there's a through line where Hildegard of Bingen and the Gregor and Gregorian chant definitely inspired certainly the Renaissance composers, which then inspired Vivaldi, and you know, going on and on and on. So mm -hmm. like, so you, 
and going all the way up to, you know, Coltrane, <laughs> you know, right. and Charlie Parker and, um, you know, uh, Kendrick Lamar. I mean, like all, yeah. all the way up to, to now. Um, and uh, that's what I love about it is that is that it is there is that that through line that goes all the way back like a thousand. It's basically is almost a thousand years. Um, and it's it's all. But, but yeah, it's like music in its purest form at that point. I love the way that on our last two podcasts, Kendrick Lamar has come up of all people. We had a blue, really? quote unquote, a blues artist. Well, because Kendrick Lamar was featured on one of ZZ Ward's songs. Oh, yeah. Mm. Oh, and yeah. Then now miss, you, you know, that brought, brought that. It's just, that's just kind of a funny, you know, it's just ironic, I think. But yeah. that uh, is funny. But no, I, yeah, it's, and it's, I think that's, it's such a beautiful thing too when you, when you develop that, that's one of my favorite things about teaching is sort of because you're teaching a language. And when someone like develops that, that, relationship with it that you these things kind of hit you differently and they're more it's more exciting in a sense i think right because mm -hmm. you really i don't know there's just a deeper connection or there can be right i mean it, right. it's you know easy to kind of just geek out on it but uh, but but any composer you know uh knows like well this is going to evoke that emotion right, right? this is right if well Camels are walking through the desert. What are you going to do, right? I mean, <laughs> we all know what we're going to hear. We all right? know what we're going to hear. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, really cool, really cool stuff, man. So where did you initially, you said you went to Berkeley later. Where did you initially go to school? And you initially went to college for music? Or, yes. Or, yeah. But then you went so to went, Berkeley right, later. Right. I went to the Sacramento School of Music, which okay, is, oh, uh, which is um, part of the you know, state school system, basically. Um, and uh, so I got my degree in music composition from there. And so I studied, you know, I studied classical composition. I also cl studied classical piano uh, while I was there. So it's, you know, years and years of study. Just curious yeah. on, um, uh, like, from a piano standpoint, like, mm. um, any favorite piano, like compositions, pianists uh, that of mm. yours personally oh you had mentioned debussy debussy um, oh yeah. yeah that that his piano music was hugely influential on me as a young composer um so i would i would certainly put put that in there and prokofiev i mean his piano music um one of his there's a piano concerto of of his i think it's number two mm -hmm. um is like one of the greatest pieces of piano music you'll ever hear <laughs> it's really, those are those are pieces know. i've looked at and gone Oh, <laughs> we'll, we'll come back to this. Well, yeah, right, right. Well, cool, man. Uh, you know, I had another question. I was just wondering, okay. like, what is something – actually, a couple related, I suppose. First being uh, uh, kind of rolling with the Kendrick Lamar thing, right? Like, <laughs> what what is something that you might listen – you know, someone listens to your music and, you know, gets a sense of, like, okay, your, your kind of vibe as a composer – What's something that might throw people for a loop, like something that you listen to in your downtime or you're super into this or that? I mean, we talked about Billie Eilish earlier. I think most of us are probably very eclectic into a lot of stuff. But are there any certain uh, modern artists or people way outside of the classical composition oh, realm that you're you're super into? Who are yes. some of your, your favorites? I'm really into uh, the, the two bands that I really like right now. One of them is very current. The other one, not so much. But uh, I'm really into this band, Keen. They were a, they're an English band. They were really popular like 20 years ago, but they just played at Radio City Music Hall last week, okay. and it was epic. Um, and I'm also really into Greta Van Fleet. So um, oh wow, okay, yeah. interesting. Yeah. They're amazing. Okay, have you um, seen them saw, live? Or? I did. Oh. I saw them in Madison Square Garden last last year when they were on tour. So okay, and okay. it was one of the best shows I've ever seen. It was well, I guess, amazing. I, I guess there's a the reason they're huge, you know. Yeah. Oh, they probably played ACL. Yeah, I, I don't even know who played ago. ACL this this year, man. I've, uh, I've really been kind of out of touch with that. Yeah, but... <laughs> Sturgill Simpson's the only one I know. Yeah, I don't know. It's... <laughs> That's probably a surprise, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I guess nothing's too really too surprising. So yeah. back to Keen, though, stylistically, mm. since I don't know that band, what, how mm. would you uh, describe Keen stylistically? Well, the thing that's cool about Keen is that they are uh, they were they were a rock band without a guitar player. So um, okay. it's all it's piano is their main is the main instrument that that is kind of driving it. Um, their music. Um, it's hard to describe. I mean, they, they they you could definitely hear the Beatles influence on them a lot. Um, there, I would, I would put Keen kind of in the same general ballpark as Coldplay, I guess a little bit okay. like early, early Coldplay, not, not the more pop 
pop stuff, but like the earlier, um, you know, like clocks and that, that kind of era of uh -huh. cold play. Um, trying to think of anybody else. I mean, they don't really, they don't really sound like anybody else. Their singer has this beautiful, very beautiful, like higher pitched kind of tenor voice. And you probably have heard their, their big hit is called Somewhere Only We Know, which was a huge hit. Uh, probably. And, uh, I, yeah, I'm yeah, sure you've heard it. I, I yeah. heard a song last night and I was like, it, it was just gorgeous. And it and it was a, it's a guy. And but it hit me the way it hit me off right off the bat was I felt Nina Simone vibes, but mm. then like in a mm. modern, you know, mm -hmm. modern mm -hmm. groove drum beat, sort of all this modern stuff came in. But right. the, the, there was a character from The Voice and it, I was like whoa it just got I immediately <laughs> looked up i i waited for the hook and looked up the song and um and now i gotta i gotta go find it i wonder if y'all know who this <laughs> is but um i mean it's and then i look it up and it's like oh this song has a, over a billion plays <laughs> on spotify but i just don't know yeah. i'm not a, you know whatever there's, oh, there's I, should, I should speaking of a billion plays so another artist Oops. that i really love uh, another artist that i really love is the weekend so oh, oh yeah i just yeah. looked them up oh my gosh they have like <laughs> so many followers on spotify it's insane oh, yeah. Yeah, like yeah. they're they're yeah. one of the top he's uh, crazy yeah there's this okay so kalo uh, k-a-l-e-o do you guys know who that is no mm -mm. check out this song called way down we go wow okay holy cow man that that thing really i'm gonna i want to type this in too so so keen i'm gonna type that in it's k-e-a-n-e -E. oh i see it's it okay yeah. Keen, gotcha okay oh yeah okay these guys are pretty happening they cool. are. All right. Um, what, uh, yeah, that's that's cool. Go ahead. A kind of question for both of you guys. Uh, like, like ambient song, you know, songs mm. that really nice, you know, just relaxing, just transport you somewhere. Like, what, what's your go-to song? A go-to. Gosh. Kevin Keller. Kevin yeah. Keller. Yeah. I, don't know. <laughs> I mean, I hate to admit it. Yeah. I mean, I, I listen yeah, to my no, own music fine. a lot. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> That'll work. That'll work. Kevin Keller for both of us. <laughs> <laughs> Kevin Keller for the win. That's right. <laughs> That's right. Two to zero. Um, but you know, in terms of ambient music, there is this. Uh, uh, there's an artist named Steve Roach. I don't know if you've heard of him, but uh, mm -hmm. he he's kind of like the John Zorn of ambient music, uh, in that he probably releases five or six albums a year. It's insane oh, wow. how yeah. prolific he is, and he's been around for forty years. So I think he's released like three hundred records. God, um, and. Crazy. Um, and I, I mean, I'm not even exaggerating. I, I, I'm pretty sure that's right. <laughs> um, and uh, but he's he's really uh, he's really amazing. Uh, so, yeah, in terms of if I just wanted to throw on some like if you just say ambient music, I'm like yeah. Steve Roach. That would like, be the first person I would turn, name. turn um, off the lights while the rain's falling, you know, yeah. just some yeah. nice, nice mood yeah. lighting. Uh, yeah. Skunk, what what uh, what would you uh I already gave. Good I already team. gave my answer. Yeah, yeah Kevin Keller. Yeah. Kevin Keller is the best <laughs> yeah. answer you could That's give. That's the best yeah. answer. Yeah. Yes, yeah. yes. And if if uh, if I can't, if I if for some reason I can't uh, listen to his songs on Spotify for whatever reason, then my next go to is going to be Pink Floyd, Marooned from the Division Bell. Oh yeah, I forget ah. about some of that Division Bell stuff is really beautiful. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I like Kevin that Keller. Old, yeah, yeah, yeah. Some of that. Uh, Kevin Keller, and then. And then after they were... their Kevin Keller album, then just the middle section of Pink Floyd's Echoes, and they're about the same length, oh. you know? Like, <laughs> Yep, there yeah. you go. Speaking of yeah. sounds, there's a sound mm -hmm. effect on that uh, in there. This, I, I don't know what happened. I'm going to try to imitate it vocally, but... And then one day, like, I had a malfunctioning... <laughs> I had a malfunctioning wah pedal, and I was like, I think that's the sound. <laughs> <laughs> Um, echoes there you go is it echoes yeah right. it's like the little kind of yeah on, on the pink like Floyd whale echoes. noises yeah. or something yeah I trying yeah, to think I, of I what mean, huge oh it's okay Floyd i, I fan, think i know course. what you're talking about yeah 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 i mean that's that is the great thing about these days too i mean i i, I love seeing the resurgence of do you have stuff on vinyl kevin of course yes okay yeah. okay i of course yep. yeah I mean, because, you know, that for a while was like, oh, go to Half Price Books and buy anything for 15 cents. And now it's like this huge resurgence. And I, I was so exciting to finally put something out on vinyl. And it's just, I don't know, it's different, right? It's very different to yeah. just have that physical product in that old old, yeah. old way. Yeah. And uh, I, I love yeah, that I mean, that I has even come released, back. Yeah, I released my, is it my 13th album? The one before even song is called Shimmer. And I released I, that on vinyl as well. So, yeah. That so okay, so what I'm I'm actually looking at your Spotify and I listen to ambient chamber music. Ah, um, okay. 
um obviously listen to even song um shimmer i haven't got how would you describe that dif- um mm. what's going on tell us shimmer. about that album. shimmer's a really cool record um it's uh it's it's all instrumental there's no vocals on that well that's totally not true there's some vocals on it now that i'm thinking about it but i mean it's primarily uh you know very sort of it's like uh it's an album that i recorded in four weeks so the the whole album was made in the month of february of 2021 um and i did and i and i had the help of a bunch of super fans of mine uh so I, i i was i would send people would send me ideas for pieces of music uh, on my blog, and then I would try it out. And um, that entire album came out kind of with sort of crowdsourcing these ideas. Uh, and it's, so it's very piano based. It's a, a, a lot of acoustic piano, but also a lot of Moog, a lot of Juno 106, a lot of drum machines and stuff. It's very retro. Uh, the, the electronic sounds are very sort of retro sounding. Oh, cool. Um, okay. It's, uh, it's a lot of fun. It's, it's one of my favorite records that I've made just in terms of the pro- how it how it came about because I usually I often start an album with a huge idea of like what it is and what it's going to sound like and the nice thing about very Shimmer, conceptual on the front yeah, end yeah very conceptual Shimmer there was none of that I didn't I didn't even have ti- a, a title like all the titles for the pieces and the title of the album came after the music was made yeah but it, it really it showed me something important which was that it's still possible to make music that is meaningful and that is emotional, even if you don't go into it with any idea of what that emotion or meaning will be. Like I, it, even, it, even if you just are making music for its, for its own sake, it, it, it still ends up being meaningful and emotional, which is really, I, that, that was kind of a mind blowing thing for me to find out was just that you could do that. <laughs> so, are there any of your yeah. albums that, I mean, I, I don't know how you feel about this question, but like that you've, uh, you know, f- this was, this is my favorite or the, are there any that resonate more than others that you really are just like, you're more proud of, or do you feel kind of equal hmm. about them all? They're all sort of their own p- place in time. Yeah. I mean, they are all sort of equal in my mind, but I, there are, you know, there are a, a, a couple that sort of stand out for me in terms of where I feel like I really like did something new or, or unexpected or, or just that the album came out like really, really well. Um, so, I mean, even song certainly, um, Emmer is another one. Also the one just before that called the front porch of heaven. Mm-hmm. Um, that record is really, I, 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 I'll even go on record and saying that like, if that were the last album I ever made, that would have been fine. <laughs> Like, okay. like the front porch of heaven was the cul- culmination of a lot of different uh, sort of ideas and, and, um, and stylistic approaches. And it just came out really, really, really well. Um, and, and I think it's got some of my, certainly has my, some of my most emotional and most meaningful music on it. Um, because it's a very personal record. Um, it's kind of autobiographical. So, um, so I, I think that's probably why I have such an attachment to it is because of what it means to me as an artist, as the artist who made it. Um, but also, I mean, it, you know, it's been, it was pretty popular. I mean, there's a couple tracks on it that get played on the radio all the time. So cool. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. Um, I, Vic, we just kind of started doing this, this thing, this idea. I used to always just take a, when you interviewed an artist, I just had a master playlist and would throw a track on there, but it's yeah. so hard to choose. And Vic got this idea. Why don't we have a playlist for each show where we sort of pick some of the artist stuff and then some of the influences of that artist. So obviously this would be, you know, stuff from Steve Roach and Keen and, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, Oh, uh, Harold, right. Harold uh, Bud. Yeah. Harold Harold Bud. Bud, yeah. All that kind of stuff. But like, this is probably a hard question, right? Like, what if I was asking you, like, okay, if you had to pick five, if someone was going to be introduced to your music and you had Mm. to pick five songs (laughs) out of your, like, you know, (laughs) I mean, hundreds, right? Here's the thing. Like, you've got hundreds of songs and you've still probably got maybe a fifth of John Zorn's material. (laughs) (laughs) But yeah, you got a lot of stuff, man. That's a hard, like, that's, it's a lot to choose from. So you're asking me what are the five songs I would send you to to listen to? Um, I would tell you to listen to Just Over the Ridge, 
which is from Front Porch of Heaven. Um, I would say listen I think to I did listen to that one. I would say listen to a track called Inverness, which is from Shimmer. Um, and I would say Even Song Two from yeah. Even Song. I love that one. Um, also Even Song Five, which is my favorite track on Even Song. <laughs> um, and let's see one more. What would what would the other one be? I'm I'm kind of looking over because I have all my albums sitting over here on a shelf, and I'm trying to remind remind myself. Oh, and a track from my second album called Blood of the Raven. Um, so that track is that's from the album Intermezzo, which came out in 1996. Um, Blood of the Raven is it's, it's pretty it's pretty awesome. It's a banger <laughs> <laughs> in terms of ambient music. Um, just saw that. Yeah. Sorry, Blood of the Raven. Okay, yeah, because yeah. I like I said, I kind of li like listened through a couple of your. I like some of the old stuff, man. I remember mm -hmm. uh, there was like Hall of Mirrors, Awakened, mm -hmm. at Moon Lake. They had some really mm. cool textures. I I literally liked some of the stuff going on. There mm -hmm. was just a, a couple I would kind of like go, okay, what was that? I just wanted to remember a couple of things, yeah. and those are those are kind of going back. Um, but yeah, cool, cool. Uh, sorry, what was the one? Blood, what? Blood, Blood of, the, of Raven. the Raven. Raven. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, awesome. That's pretty cool that you threw those out there, man. I love that. All right. Um, I have one more question. Okay. Favorite, because we're talking, you know, cinematic stuff and all oh, this. Okay. There. All right. C films. I mean, Cooper, mm. you already mentioned um, 2001. It's kind of a no brainer, right? What are some of your sure. favorite films? Just, I mean, they could just be film for film's sake, but also probably particularly just the way it works with the with the score. You know what I mean? a huge fan of the the two dune movies and ah, the score okay. for those um I, those both those movies are amazing um but hans zimmer you know i'm and i'm not a hans zimmer fanboy by any stretch uh, i mean i'm i think he does some great work sometimes um but dune i think he outdid himself completely in terms of what he did in terms of um, the so the sounds and the textures and how it's all put together, uh, the, there's this, this the music that he do did in Dune Two, um, the music for the scene where um, Austin Butler uh, is, is it's his character is that scene that's all in like sort of black and white. It's kind oh. of a, almost like a gladiator kind of in the arena, scene. right? Yeah. yeah, in the mm -hmm. arena, that music is insane and it's so good. And I just listen to it and I'm like, I have no idea what that even is. Like what's making those sounds. I don't know how he's doing it. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, what's his character? Oh yeah. Fade Rotha is his name. Hmm. And um, that like, that's an example of incredibly good cinema music and the way that it works within the, the context of the scene is amazing. Like you wouldn't, you wouldn't have the same, if you took the music out of that scene, it would not have the effect that it does. Mm -hmm. Like it's absolutely integral, I think. So, yeah. It, it's amazing. Like think of that just between really epic cinematic orchestral music to sparse, ethereal, whatever, you know, yeah. to uh, what's his name? Harold Faltermeyer soundtracks, right? Those <laughs> movies wouldn't be the same. They're just so wonderful right. because of that style, you know? So it's, yep. it's just, it's amazing. I mean, it, it, I'm sure this kind of stuff's all over the internet. I mean, I recently, I saw someone put the, the ending credits to <laughs> a predator to the golden girls theme. song. They're like, this is amazing. You know, it's like, so you could just change everything with yeah. music. You know, I, I recently saw a scene from, uh, was it return of the Jedi with free bird, Leonard Skinner. Oh yeah, so that, that was me. pretty awesome. Actually, that's probably you that sent it to me. It probably was, yeah. I yeah. Like it, it totally fits. Yeah, but it is it is cool the the impact that that has. Um, well, cool. I don't know if there's anything you want to add, Kevin, or anything else you got, Vic. But man, this has been an awesome conversation, dude. Awesome. Really yeah, appreciate this has been you really taking fun, the time. Guys. Yeah, this has been very fun. So thanks even for, uh, is thanks out for having me now. Uh, it is. So, yep. Yeah. Kevin Keller on Spotify and all your albums are on there. So yes, absolutely. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, absolutely. Check it out. Um, and then we're going to put together a, a playlist for this episode as well. Oh. All right. right. And can you please say one more time where your ballet is premiering? Uh, yeah. Mm. When and where? Uh, it's the middle of November. It's uh, November. It's in Pittsburgh at the, the Kelly Strayhorn theater, which is in, um, it's not quite downtown, but it's, you know, it's in the city of Pittsburgh. Uh, it's on um, 
November 15th, 16th, and 17th uh, in Pittsburgh. And then the following weekend, November 23rd and 24th in New York at the Actors Temple. And you can get awesome. you can get those tickets by going to the dance company's website. So the name of the dance company doing it is Bodyography, and that's B O D I O G R A P H Y. Uh, so go to bodyography.com and you'll be able to find ticket links for those performances. And anybody interested for more on you, that's just uh, I believe that's just kevinkeller.com, correct? Yes, it is. I can find you there. Yep. Awesome. Cool. Well, thank cool. you so much for joining us, Kevin. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, just let's just hang out for a bit once we uh, wrap okay. up. Okay. And right. uh, guys, we will check you guys out later. Skunk, anything else? Sign us off, Vic. All right. Uh, I don't have a good outro like I do my intros, but. Oh, come on. <laughs> All right, Kevin, thank you so much for joining us uh, for Skunk Manhattan and myself. Uh, you guys have a great rest of the week. Be good and listen to some good music. Boom.